Good morning, guys. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, something we did at Lifeline the other day. And it's kind of a hard subject for me um, because as I was doing it, I was it sort of went in directions that <clears throat> I wasn't planning on or expecting. And the funny thing is, is that it's about expectations. That's what I want to talk to you about. First off, I'd like to pray because I want to invite the Lord in to help me share what I feel is on my heart and I want to do an accurate and good job. So, dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would come now and just help me to speak to whoever might listen to this video. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill me and anoint me to be able to speak truth forward and that you would be blessed and honored and that people would... Um, grow and be encouraged and just thank you father for who you are and thank you most of all for your son jesus and it's in his name i pray amen it's a funny thing about expectations because um we can't always tell when our expectations are real or false um this past week for me I had an expectation that something was going to happen and it actually everything was in place and um Turns out it didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. And it actually really affected me, sort of sent me into a downhill spiral in my spirit because I wasn't sure what we were going to do um, when my expectation wasn't met. Um, but I want to challenge you guys today about, I want to like kind of explore with you what does the Bible say about expectations and um what are the conditions by which um, our expectations can be met? So I actually did a word search to find out what is the expectation mean? And it's the act or state of expecting. And then I thought, well, that doesn't help me much. What does expect mean? And it says regard is likely to happen. So when you expect something, you're, ex you're regarding that it's going to happen. Um, but then I thought about unexpected and that's, that's um, you're planning on it not happening. You're not regarding that it happened. And as I searched the scriptures about the cross-reference of expect, it brought me across some stories that I would like to share with you. Now, I've shared with you before about how God came to a man named Abraham, and he gave him a promise that, that he would give him this land, which is the land of Israel. And then he said that he would have descendants more than the sands of the sea, even though he was an old man. Well, Isaac, in his old age, him and Sarah had a child named Isaac. And Isaac, uh, Abraham had Isaac, and then Isaac grew up, and he had twins. He, um, him and Rebekah had Jacob and Esau. Well, Esau was the older, but he got hungry one day, and sold his birthright to his brother. And so I uh, Jacob ends up getting the blessing because how the blessing normally came is through the right hand of the father to the oldest son. And just, uh, Jacob was the younger of the twins, but he ended the blessing ended up coming through him. And he ended up with 12 kids. So his kids, he had 12 kids, um, but his two youngest kids, um, he loved very much. And he had a favorite, and his name was Joseph. He was the next to the youngest. Well, the other brothers got jealous of Joseph, and they ended up selling him into slavery. And he went to Egypt, and after continuing to be a righteous man, um, after a lot of trials and tribulations, he ends up rising to second in command in Egypt. Well, um, through a series of events, through like a famine and stuff, his, his family was actually driven to go to Egypt where um, they're reunited with Joseph. And Joseph actually finally gets to come see his dad. And we're going to sort of pick up in this spot because when Joseph comes to see his dad, he's, he's got two kids in tow, his two sons. He's got one's name Manasseh and one's Ephraim. And he comes to see his dad. Uh, Jacob. And at this point, um, Jacob's name has been changed to Israel. God met with him and changed his name to Israel. And he's, and he's, uh, has a hard time seeing and he's weak, which is funny because when Jacob got his blessing, his father actually, um, blessed him thinking it was Esau when it was actually Jacob. 
And he had a hard time seeing too. So now Jacob is old in years and his eyes have grown dim. And he says when he sees, gets to see uh, Joseph and his kids, he says, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your children as well. That's in Genesis um, 11, 48, 11. Um, so Jacob had no expectation and the unexpected happened. He got to see his son Joseph before he died and he got to meet his two grandchildren. Well, when uh, Jacob goes to bless Joseph and his children, the, the boys, he actually crosses his hand and he puts his right hand on the younger and his left hand on the older. And when Joseph sees this, it displeases him and he tries to correct his father's hands. And his father says, no, I know my son, I know. But he wanted to bless him in the order that he did. And that was putting his hand, his right hand on Ephraim's head instead of putting it on Manasseh, even though Manasseh was older. Um, now that was unexpected. Joseph had something unexpected to happen to him besides all the unexpected that he had through his entire life. It was unexpected of him to be thrown in a cistern by his brothers. It was unexpected of him to be sold into slavery. It was unexpected of him to be falsely accused of rape. Um, it was unexpected of him to go to jail. It was unexpected of him to, uh, interpret gene god gave him the ability to interpret dreams which would eventually get him out of jail and risen to second in command it was unexpected of him that he would be able to see his family again so joseph had a lot of unexpected things happen in his life but he kept his eyes on the lord and so did jacob well then we're going to talk about like when god's children face this expected or unexpected or have expectations um, that aren't met. Well, I'm going to talk to you about David. David is a king um, that God said was a man after his own heart. Um, how he ends up becoming king actually is from an interesting story. The Israelites, after they were delivered um, out of Egypt... They were watching how all the other people were behaving and they were um, delivered to the promised land. They were watching how all the other people behaved and they said, hey, we want a king. And God had already told them, had sent them prophets and sent them judges, prophets to judge um, over their land. So they already had leaders, but they wanted a king like the other people. They saw the, how the other people were acting and they wanted a king. Well, there was this guy named Saul, not to be confused with Saul of the New Testament. This is Saul of the Old Testament, and his dad loses a bunch of donkeys. And so he goes out searching for his donkeys. Well, while they're in this land, um, the guy he's with says, hey, you know, the man of God, the prophet, um, is here. Let's go to him. And his name was Samuel. Let's go to him and see if he can tell us where the donkeys are. Well, the people had asked for a king and Samuel basically told them they would regret it, but God had granted what they wanted because of they wouldn't listen. So Saul comes thinking he's just going to find out where his donkeys are. And this man, Samuel says, hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back and you're going to run into these two guys and they're going to tell you that the donkeys were found. And then you're going to run into these three guys and they're going to be carrying goats and bread and a jug of wine. I, they're going to give you the bread. I want you to take the bread. And then you're going to run into this group of people who men who are prophesying. And when you turn away from me, God's going to give heart. you a new heart. So um, Saul turns around and goes. And when he turns around to go, God gives him a new heart. But there was also something Samuel said. He said, hey, this is what I want you to do. After these things take place, I want you to go to this place called Gilgal. I want you to go to this place called Gilgal. And behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you should do. So Saul's job was after he went and after he went through all this meeting, the two guys and the, the three guys and then the group of people, 
Saul's supposed to go down to Gilgal, like Samuel tells him. So Saul does, and he waits the seven days, according to the appointed time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring to me the burnt offering and the peace offerings that Samuel had just said that he would do after seven days. He would come and do that. He would do the peace offerings and the burnt offerings because God had commanded that only the Levitical tribe could do that. And Samuel was a Levite, so he he was the only one allowed to do burnt offerings and peace offerings. Not just anybody could do it. It had to be from the tribe of Levi. And he was the prophet of Israel at the time, so he was the one who was going to do it. Well, uh, Saul, he waits the seven days. He sees that Samuel doesn't show up at the time he expected him to. So he sees the people starting to scatter he gets nervous, so he does it himself. It says that as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, Saul, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him to greet him. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me and that you did not come in the appointed days and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. Therefore, I said, now the Philistines came down against me at Gilgal and I've not asked for favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Well, Saul expected Samuel to be there at a specific time. And Samuel did come in seven days, just not at the exact time that Saul expected him to. And then because he did that, Samuel says to him, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord will have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him ruler over the people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. See, Saul one day went looking for his donkeys, his dad's donkeys. He ran into this guy named Samuel. Samuel prophesies over him and says, hey, you're going to go back the way you're supposed to go. You're going to run into two guys who are going to tell you the donkeys are found. You're going to run into three guys, and they're going to have a jug of wine, some bread, and some goats. Take the bread. And then you're going to run into a group of people, of, of men, prophets, and they're going to be prophesying, and God will give you a new heart, and you're going to prophesy. And it happens. But there's also something else that happens. Samuel tells Saul that he was going to be the king of Israel. He was going to be the first king of Israel. Well, Saul was so scared of that that he went and hid him among some luggage when they were trying to anoint him um, king over Israel. But Samuel tells Saul specifically, hey, go down to Gilgal, wait seven days. I'm going to come there. I'm going to tell you what to do in seven days, and then I will give burnt offerings. But instead, Saul, he waits the seven days he thinks that Samuel should be there when at whatever time, but because he doesn't show up when he expects him to, he does the offering himself, which is a great sin against God because only the Levitical tribe are allowed to give burnt offerings. So it was Samuel's job to do it, not Saul's. And because of this, Samuel comes and he tells Saul, like, hey, because you did this, the kingdom's going to be torn away from you. God's going to give his uh the kingdom to somebody else someone after his own heart which happens to be david so saul leaves his dad's house is expecting to see some donkeys find some donkeys and turns comes to the man of god seeking for where the donkeys are finds out he's going to be anointed king and then gets a kingdom torn from him because he didn't listen to what was, he didn't do what was expected of him, which was to wait this full seven days. Because Samuel came after seven days, he just didn't come at the exact time that Saul thought he should be there. And Saul had his eyes focused on the fact that the people were leaving him um, and that the Philistines were coming down and he thought they were going to attack. So his eyes weren't on the command of the Lord, they were on his circumstances. So now, you know, Samuel expected a certain thing from Saul. Saul didn't meet those expectations. Saul lost his kingdom. 
Saul expected Samuel to be there at a very specific time, but because he didn't have the patience and faith to wait, he decided to take it in his own hands to offer up offerings to the Lord, which was against God's command that only the Levites could do that, only a Levite, and Saul was not a Levite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, why do I tell you all that? What's the deal with all that? Well, I'm going to tell you about a couple more people. There's a guy named Naaman. He's like the king's servant. And the king wants to see Naaman healed. He has leprosy. So he sends a letter to the king of Israel and says, hey, can you heal him? Well, the king thinks that the other king is trying to pick a fight with him. But um, Elisha's there and he says, hey, tell that man... Um, tell that man to go down to the river and um, have him dip in the water seven times and he'll be cured. That his health will be, he'll, his, his uh, health will be restored to him. And so, well, instead of listening to Elisha, the um, Naaman gets mad and this is what he says. He says, but Naaman was furious and went away and said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. And then he says, hey, aren't the rivers that we have back in Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Why should I go dip in this water? You know, I thought he would come out and wave his hand and make it all better. But he had a servant girl who was from Israel and said, hey, listen to him and go do it. So Naaman does. He goes and he dips in the Jordan seven times. And guess what? He's restored to health. See, Naaman came expecting that Elisha would come out and wave his hand. His expectation was that Elijah would behave a certain way. And when Elijah didn't, it made him mad. And he, um, he almost missed his blessing because he had an expectation of the way that Elisha would heal him. And he almost missed a blessing, but because the girl came in and said, please, the servant said, please, just go do what he says. If he had to told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? But since he tells you this simple thing, just go do it. And he's healed. Now, let me ask you a question. I want to kind of challenge you right now. What are things in your life, whether it be people, whether it be God, whether it be yourself, what are expectations you have on yourself, on others, on God, that either God has exceeded your expectations, not met your expectations, or something altogether unexpected happens that has nothing to do with your expectations. Like Saul did not expect to be king, but he got anointed king. He also didn't expect to lose his kingdom, but he lost his kingdom because he expected Samuel to be there when he thought he would be there, but because he wasn't there when he expected, it cost him dearly. Because he acted in his expectation or his unmet expectation. Naaman almost missed his blessing altogether because he was unwilling to do what was asked of him because his expectations were unmet. Saul was unwilling to do what he was supposed to do because his expectations were unmet. What happens when the unrighteous or those who don't follow Jesus have expectations. We're not going to jump to a man named Solomon. Now, Solomon was one of King David's children, okay, by Bathsheba. And David had a bunch of sons, you know, and a lot of them died. But we're going to start with the son Adonijah and or Adoniah, depending on how you say it. Um, I'm actually not sure if it's Adonijah or Adonijah, but um, Adonijah tried to usurp David's um, David's plan to make Solomon 
who was the younger son again. It was Adoniah and then it was Solomon. And again, um, the blessing was going to go to Solomon, the younger brother. He was going to be king of Israel. Well, Adoniah didn't like that so much. So what he did is he gathered all of his other brothers and some officials and stuff. And he tried to make himself be king. Well, Nathan the prophet um, heard about it and, and went to... David's wife and said, hey, we need to talk to the king and tell him to make Solomon king before um, Adoniah takes over. So um, Bathsheba and Nathan, they go to David and say, hey, you know, did you know that Adonijah, uh, or Adonijah, depending on how they want to say it, um, is trying to make himself king. So David makes Solomon king. Um, well, when Adoniah finds out, oh no, they made Solomon king. He's scared of what they're going to do to him because he tried to usurp um, Solomon being king and tried to make himself king when it was um, God's will for Solomon to be king. Then um, Adoniah runs to the altar of the Lord and like clings on and, and begs for his life. And this is Solomon's response. He says, if he is a, in 1 Kings 1, 52, Solomon says, if he is a worthy man, not one of his hairs will fall to the ground. But if wickedness is found in him, he will die. So, so King Solomon sent and they brought him down from the altar. He came and prostrated himself before King Solomon. And Solomon said to go, said to him, go to your house. Well, Adoniah that day was spared his life by King Solomon, even though he tried to take the throne from his brother. Um, but Adoniah still had that expectation and he came up with a different plan. When David, in his old days, he, he couldn't keep warm. So they had given him a maidservant and her name was Abishag or Abishag. Um, she was a Shunammite. And Adoniah knew that she served David, you know, was with King his father David until his death. So he goes to Solomon's mom, Bathsheba, and says, hey, can you do this thing for me? Can you ask the king if I can have that woman for my wife? Well, when... He asked Solomon, Solomon understands what he's trying to do. So he says this, he says, now, therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and set me on the throne of David, my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, surely Adoniah shall be put to death today. So King Solomon sent um, Benahiah, the son of Jehoadia, I don't, Ada, um, and he fell upon him so that he died. Adoniah had an expectation that he would be king because he was older than Solomon. But God had a plan for Solomon to be king. Adoniah had his own expectations. And because his expectations weren't met, it cost him his life. How many times in your life are you missing a blessing of God because of unmet expectations or because of expectations that you have put on people, false expectations? Or on God. I know for me, especially this week, I had an expectation and it wasn't met. And it sort of sent me into a tailspin. There's been times in my life where I assumed that things would work out a specific way. Had like a linear plan that God was going to do it this way. Because I believed it was his will. And it didn't happen at all the way that I thought. And it sent me into a tailspin. This weekend, it sent me into a tailspin to the point that I didn't want to be around anybody. But there, there was a time, about five years after walking with Jesus, that it sent me into a tailspin to the point that I ran from God. Excuse me, in disobedience. You know, I was a little like Saul, hiding in the luggage when they wanted to anoint him king. Or a little like Esau, when his birthright was given up for a bowl of soup. What expectations in your life are you 
giving up God's will for your life. My unmet expectations. I let unmet expectations drive me away from the Lord instead of to him. But Naaman, he got healed because even though he had expectations of how he thought Elisha would do it, he allowed himself to go dunk and listen and obey, and he was healed. Adoniah had expectations, unrealistic expectations of him being king and refused to accept that his expectations were not God's will, ended up dead. Saul had no expectations and ended up being anointed king and lost his kingdom because of expectations he had on Samuel. What are your expectations? I can't answer that for you. What do you do when the unexpected happens? Whether that unexpected appears good or bad or whatever, there have been times in my life where when the unexpected happens, I assume it's punishment, something I did wrong, which is what I did this week. I assume that something didn't work out because of something I did. I assume that I was doing something wrong. Instead of stopping and thinking maybe God was protecting me from something or maybe he had something better for me to do than what I had planned. And sometimes in our unmet expectations, we can build resentment toward people, toward God. And we find ourselves angry or pissed off because we're not being or we're not getting what we believe should be happening. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm thinking that it makes me think about the election, which is here shortly. There are going to be a lot of disappointed people because whatever side you fall on, Whatever belief you believe, somebody's expectation is not going to be met. And what can happen when we have that is we can be cruel and mean and violent to people we blame for our expectations not being met. You know, Joseph got um, was displeased when his father put the blessing on his younger son instead of his older. It displeased him. Naaman was angry because Elisha didn't sit there and wave his hand and make them all better in the moment. We can do that. We can do that. I've done it. And the thing is, is I want to tell you something. I'm going to sort of blend expectations with something else. Our expectations will come from what we value. I had a beautiful talk with my daughter the other day, uh, my daughter Tiffany. We were talking about things that drive us, drive our expectations and drive us in, in you know, what, make us, what makes us passionate and, and what drives us in, in, in this life. And for her, it's, she has a drive for truth and justice. It's something that's innate in her and she's very passionate about it. And I started thinking about me and I realized what I'm passionate about. It's value and purpose. I refurbish furniture, do it all the time. That piece right there, I don't know if you can see it. The lights aren't on. It's quite lovely. Um, I redid that. That's one of my pieces that I redid. That lamp side of, uh, no, that was free at a garage sale. Um, I often do that. I have a lot of pieces in my house, the majority of them. Um, wood pieces were all under... Most of them were, there's a couple that might be over $100, maybe $125, but most of them were freebies on the side of the road or at Goodwill or Salvation Army or resale shop or garage sale. Because what I do is when I, or people give them to me, when I see something on the side of the road, especially wood furniture, and I notice that it has been discarded, it, I feel compelled. It's weird. I feel compelled to pick it up, bring it home, and restore it. Restore it because I see the value in it, even though somebody else may not have seen the value in it. I see the value in it. 
and I want to restore that to a place of purpose. If it's a table, I want, I see the value in it and I want to restore it so that it can become a table again, so that it can continue to bless um, the maker of it to accomplish the job by which it was designed for. That's my passion. It's not just with furniture, it's with people. My passion is to see people see their value. And in seeing their value, they'll see their purpose. And if they can see their purpose, even, even in the times of pain or disappointment or unmet expectations, if you know that unmet expectations or pain, if you know that there's value in it, then you're going to know that there's purpose in it. And your spirit will soar in spite of your circumstances, in spite of your unmet expectations. Your spirit's going to soar anyway. So again, I ask you, what are your expectations? I am the hardest on myself than I am anybody else. And the reason I have a passion about value and purpose is because I am usually the first in line to say, I don't see my value and I don't see my purpose. I'm the first in line to do it. That's why I'm so passionate about it because I want to make sure that nobody else feels the way that I feel. I don't want people to think that they don't have value. I don't, I don't want people to not know that they have purpose, that there's a plan, even in pain. What expectations in your life have caused you pain? Whether the unexpected or just unmet expectations, what expectations in your life have caused you pain? And can you see the value in the pain? Because if you see value and purpose in the pain, it'll make whatever you go through worth it. It'll make it worth it. Something happened to me this week and it caused me pain. But in the midst of my pain, someone, it affected someone else in a way that inspired them to do something that they wouldn't normally do. And you know what? Because of that, the pain was worth it. The unmet expectation was worth it because through my unmet expectation, someone was inspired to do something positive that they would normally not do. It served its purpose. I said, totally worth it. If it ministered to somebody else to cause them to act positively in a way that they normally wouldn't act, worth it. There was purpose and value in the pain. There was purpose and value in the unmet expectation. We're going to go to the New Testament now because I don't want to end there. I want to talk about what the New Testament has to say about this. There's a guy, his name is John. Not John from the disciples, but John the Baptist. And John sort of came out of nowhere, went into the desert and started preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in Luke 15, it says, Now while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ. So this guy comes out out of nowhere and he starts preaching repentance. And they're in expectation, is this the Christ? And he clearly tells him, no, he wasn't, but that he was making a way for Christ to come, who happened to be his cousin. And we're going to skip to Luke 21. And this is where expectations can be kind of scary. It says in Luke 21, verse 25, there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay among the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. There's coming a time where the expectation is going to be Christ's return. 
And with Christ's return, for those who don't know him as Lord and Savior, the expectation is judgment. That's a scary expectation. That's a scary expectation. Hebrew 10, 27, 27 says this, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But you, but we are not one of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the persevering, to the preserving of the soul. There's going to be time where judgment's going to come on all mankind. For those who are in Christ, we're forgiven. For those who aren't, it says, it says a fury of fire, actually, which will consume the adversaries. See, when my expectations aren't met in this world or even expectations I have on God um, aren't met, I can rest assured of something. I can be confident in knowing that my God is for me. He promises in his word. So if things don't work out, if my expectations aren't met, I can trust that God's got it. He's got a plan and he's going to work it out for my good. And he does. He does. This week, I struggled. I struggled because it, for the first time in my life, I was wondering if he was on time. And I've never worried about God being on time. I tell everybody all the time, God's never early and he's never late. He's always on time. But this week I thought, is he on time? I'm not sure. I'm confused. But you know what? He was on time because he had a bigger plan. He was going to use my circumstance to help somebody grow in their faith. And that excites me. Even in my struggles, in my, my battle to understand what was happening, he used that circumstance to help somebody grow in their faith. It was worth it. We all have expectations, good and bad expectations. There are some things that we can expect to happen, like we're all going to die someday. We're all going to die. And how you perceive death is going to affect how you live. Our expectations are going to affect how we live. If you are in Christ, you're okay. God's got you. God's got you. There's a man, his name is Paul. And Paul's like a pretty cool dude. Like everything he did was for the love of the church and the love of Christ and for the glory of God. And Paul gets, you know, arrested. And instead of getting angry at God and saying, hey, my expectations aren't met, this is his, this is his response. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. Because there's some people that were talking about Jesus to get Paul in trouble. They weren't there to share the gospel. They were there to get Paul in trouble. And he says, in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Christ, of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now as always, be exalted in my body, whether in life or in death. So Paul was putting his expectations on the fact that God was going to work it out for God's glory and his good, whatever the outcome. Whatever the outcome. His expectation and hope. It says, my earnest expectation and hope. So his expectation was in the person of Christ. And that he wouldn't be put to shame because he had Jesus. 
and he had Jesus on his side. That's an expectation that's a healthy one, guys. He says whether he lived or died, Jesus was on his side, and he could hope in that expectation. So can we. And you know um, that when we endure these things, when we encounter these various trials, that the testing of our faith will, faith will produce perseverance. Uh, well, he actually says endurance from the scripture that I'm, there's a place that he says perseverance, but here in James 1 and 2, he says endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all generously without reproach and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So if we're wanting God to answer our prayers and to meet our expectations, we need to make sure our expectations are godly ones. And even if they're godly ones, they still may not turn out the way that we think because God's got a bigger plan. And we have to trust that when we in those moments that we can ask for wisdom, like God help me to understand why I didn't get that job. Help me to understand why this is happening. Help me to be righteous and glorious to you, Lord, in the process of whatever is happening, whether in life or in death, Lord. I lean into you and onto you, Lord. I need you. Um, and First John it talks a lot about um, knowing that you overcome because you have eternal life. Verse 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is a confidence which we have before him, that if we, we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we ask for him. It also says we know that, the, that, that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is a true God in eternal life. If we lack wisdom, we can ask God, which is what I told you it said in James. And here in 1 John, He's talking to us again as believers and he says that um, to know that you have eternal life. And before that, he addresses how you know you're born of God because you love the father and you love the child born of him. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. If we want our expectations met, we've got to honor God in our life. And I'm not talking about name it and claim it. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is when we seek Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our desires, our motives, our feelings, our thoughts will eventually line up with his will because his spirit will be in us, changing us to the, excuse me, to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And we are changed to the likeness of Jesus Christ, our desires, our motives, our thoughts, our feelings, our words, our actions will line up with the will of God. I can say, God, I want a million dollars. I can even say, God, I expect a million dollars. It doesn't mean I'm going to get a million dollars because I have an unrealistic expectation. And if my expectations are unrealistic, they may be unmet, but it doesn't mean that they always will be. Because I've seen God do things in my life that I never expected him to do. And he did it. What are your expectations? What are your expectations? Are they based on scripture? Are they based on the fact that God promises he'll never leave you nor forsake you? Are they based on the fact that he says, abide in me? 
Are your expectations based on the fact that he says, believe in me, trust me, serve me, love me, believe in me, believe in my son? What are your expectations? Only you can answer that. There are a lot of people in the Bible whose expectations weren't met. There are a lot of people in the Bible whose expectations were exceeded. There are some who lost their everything because of their unmet expectations or their reactions to their unmet expectations. A lot of people who lost because of their reactions to their unmet expectations. Don't let your expectations drive your decisions. Don't let your unmet expectations drive your decisions. Place yourself squarely in the hands of God, a loving God, a kind God who is in heaven and he's sovereign over everything and he's control over everything and he has a plan and even when our expectations aren't being met or things don't look the way that we think they should, we have to trust and believe he has a plan and a purpose that there's value in it and there's purpose in it. There's a scripture in Hebrews. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So when you have to do with Jesus... Your intentions, your expectations, your hearts, your souls are laid bare. And if you want to know what to do, you can approach the throne of grace with confidence because we have a Savior. Because Hebrews 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You need wisdom, ask God. You need grace, approach the throne. It's the throne of grace. What are your expectations of yourself, of your family, of your friends, of your God, of your job? What are they? Lay them at the feet of Jesus. He knows your heart and he'll search your heart. And he'll give you the desires of your heart when your desires line up with his will. What is his will? The only way to find out is to read his word, to receive his son as Jesus, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to be filled with his spirit, to read his word, to pray. That's how our expectations line up with the will of God. That's how we know we're children of God, because we obey his commands and love his people. That's how we're going to see the value and purpose in our lives. That's how our expectations will change for our good and God's glory. If your expectations have been unmet, then maybe they're unrealistic expectations. If your expectations have exceeded far more, than you ever could have imagined. God's blessings on you. Give him praise for that. He inhabits the praise of his people. Give him praise for the unmet expectations. Give him praise for the met expectations. Give him glory. See the value and the purpose in your life. Surrender your expectations to God. Trust him. With this election coming, it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican. What matters is Jesus Christ. Is he your Lord and Savior? If he is, seek him out. Ask him what to do. Spend time praying and fasting. If you really want to see things change, if you really want to see your expectations line up with the word of God, fast and pray. 
Complaining about it on Facebook and arguing with people isn't going to change anything. But prayer and fasting might. Read God's word. Even if it's just a verse a day. Seek his word. See what he has to say. Lay your expectations at the foot of the cross. Approach the throne of grace with confidence. Knowing that what Jesus Christ did on the cross was enough. That he rose again. And that our sins were buried with him. And when he rose again, he freed us from, he freed us from sin. If we sin, it's because we choose to. But through the power of his spirit, we don't have to yield to the flesh anymore. We don't have to yield to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. We're free from those things in Christ Jesus. But we've got to yield to his spirit. We've got to walk in his spirit. We can't grieve his spirit or quench his spirit's fire. We've got to have the faith and the belief. And if you lack those things, if you lack the wisdom and understanding, I read it to you. James says, ask and he will give. Just don't doubt. Believe. And if you don't believe, ask God to help your unbelief. That's scripture too. I love you. I pray that you would lay your expectations at the foot of the cross. Actually, at the foot of the empty tomb. Because my Jesus is resurrected. My Jesus is at the right hand of God, interceding on behalf of the saints. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a saint according to the word of God. Put your faith and trust in him. Lay your expectations down. Pick up your shield of faith. Pick up the armor of God. Fight the battle that God has set for you until he comes again, and he will come, and he is coming. Remember the white stone? He's coming. He's going to give us a new name. I hope this blesses you. I hope it makes sense. I'll see you later.